Negotiations can be in writing. They can be verbal. They can be over the telephone. They can be, you know, in the old days, you'd say they could be by letter and fax. Now, of course, they're by email and text message. And um, sometimes that can really create issues. And here's why. Let's, let's take a, a common example, actually, and, and any of you who work in the litigation field uh, are, are familiar with this. It's settlement negotiations. You've got a lawsuit pending. You're trying to work out a settlement agreement. The lawyers are going back and forth. The parties are involved going back and forth. You're sitting there trying to evaluate what's happening. You're drafting, um, uh, potentially drafting a settlement document. Sometimes, in those negotiations, because there is not a requirement legally that they be in writing, those negotiations can reach such a point that uh, it might appear that a binding agreement has been entered into, a binding contract, because a settlement agreement is just a type of contract. So here's how you, in negotiations, when you're, if you're evaluating a, a, a case, if you are administering contracts and seeing whether they've been entered into or not and how the negotiations led up to them, you need to do a couple of things. One of them is if the intention is to enter into a written agreement, there needs to be the same disclaimer we talked about in the letter of intent, which is the parties have not entered into a binding agreement a binding contract until such time as it has been reduced to a writing agreed upon by all the parties and signed by all the parties. And that really, I mean, for instance, when I do settlement negotiations, and I know some of the other people here in my office, when they do settlement negotiations, they have a set little bug that they put at the bottom of every communication and we've got it set up. You just, you know, paste, paste, paste on every email back and forth. Because absent that, you run the risk of having the other side say, well, we agreed on everything. So that's that. And it's not. If you have a disclaimer that says, no, 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 we don't have a binding anything until we have it done. Now, this is a technique that... Um, former Secretary of State James Baker, who was Secretary of State in the first Bush administration, he, he is, well, he's still alive. He, he was a wonderful lawyer and a, and a wonderful negotiator. And he used to start every negotiation session. This is if he was a lawyer doing a business deal, if he was working on a settlement agreement, if he was Secretary of State trying to negotiate a treaty or a pact with another country. He always started every meeting the same way which was, I only have one ground rule. Nothing's agreed upon until everything is agreed upon. And then he would turn and look at the whole room and say, is there anybody here who's not willing to live with that? And as you can imagine, everybody said, oh, yes, we agree with that. And in that simple moment, he made sure that nobody accidentally entered into a contract. Nobody accidentally agreed to anything because it meant that you could um, really talk openly, you could horse trade, you could do the negotiations that need to be done. And that's why when I say here you have to make clear what's agreed upon and what isn't, until everything is agreed upon and until you put it down on paper, it's important to make clear that you haven't agreed really on anything. I think that's the most important thing. Now, if you break off negotiations, which does happen, let's say you're going back and forth and back and forth, and finally you just get your client or, or the contract that you're working with, whatever, it just isn't going to work. You need to say that. I know that sound, it sounds like a rule you would get in kindergarten. If you're going to stop negotiating, tell the other side you've stopped negotiating. But I spent over a year litigating a case for a client who 
just got so put out with the other side, they were even to the point of exchanging written drafts. Now, there was an understanding and a legal requirement, actually, that the contract be in writing. But they just got put out with the other side, and so they quit talking to them. Now, that was not the correct way to handle it, and they recognized that later. They recognized it when it took over a year to prevail in litigation, and with the according costs that went with that litigation, they realized that a simple email that said, we are now breaking off negotiations and we do not wish to enter into a contract with you, the end, would have been a lot cheaper and would have been a lot clearer. So, you know, negotiations have a lot of back and forth. There's a lot that goes on. But if you don't um, really uh, speak up and say what you mean and mean what you say and, you know, for most legal contracts, get it in writing and make clear that nothing is binding until it's in writing, signed by everybody, and then that's the deal. So representation, that cuts off, you know, representations that might have been made in the negotiations that then later were dropped. You don't get somebody coming back saying, oh, well, they said this product would do X, when the actual specs in the contract say something less than X. You don't get that problem. And that's, that's what it comes down to. And that's where, you know, ultimately litigation about written contracts, that's mostly where it comes from, is, is that kind of lack of definiteness. And that's why you have to really make sure you've agreed on terms, that you're clear, that the essential terms are spelled out in a contract, because you run the risk either of having a court find that there was not a contract or in some instances, say for the sale of goods under the Uniform Commercial Code, particularly Article 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code, courts will sometimes supply terms that are not negotiated and they may not supply the terms that you or your client wanted. It's that simple. Uh, if 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 uh, the the time within which a contract must be performed is not spelled out, for instance, for the sale of goods, a court might supply something like reasonable in the industry as that term. Well, if you're a purchaser, you may have needed them more quickly than that. You may have needed them in 30 days instead of, you know, and if the industry, they say, well, the usual time for production and delivery of such goods is 90 days, you didn't get what you wanted. And you've got to be willing to, to spell that out and evaluate and make sure it's there. Because if it's not there, uh, you run the risk of having a court sometimes supply um, those terms. Now, obviously, we've been talking predominantly about written contracts. And written contracts are... Uh, 99% of what lawyers deal with uh, if they're done right. And as I've said, they have to be clear. There's no magic formula. You don't have to use a lot of mumbo jumbo. Uh, you ought to be able to give it to a well-educated teenager and say, read this and tell me what the people are supposed to do. And if a contract can't pass that test, there's probably something wrong with it. And more, moreover, there's probably a pretty good chance that if anything even minor goes wrong, it's going to result in litigation. And the last thing, really, if you're entering into a deal and you've calculated the economics of it where each side's making a small profit based on the mutual benefits of the exchange, if you throw litigation costs on top of it, there goes the deal. The, deal's, the economic value of the deal is shot in most instances. So that's why it's so important. I know this is against my interest. I am a trial lawyer. I see contracts when they go wrong more often than I see them when they go right. It's against my economic interest to say, oh, you should avoid litigation. But it's by far the best advice you'll, you'll get. If, if, if you're involved with a business, with a service industry, with a manufacturer or anything, 
legal costs, while built into overhead um, as an anticipated part of net profit, you know, if something goes haywire on a big contract, it can, it can mess up the whole economics of a company. So that's why it's so important if you're drafting, if you're administering, um, if you are litigating about, to understand that, to understand that that's what happens when a contract isn't done correctly. You have to make sure it reflects the deal. You have to make sure it's in plain language. You have to make sure it has all the essential elements. And you have to make sure there aren't any hidden traps like uh, undefined terms. That's the essence of getting to a good contract. Now, that's if they're in writing. If they're oral contracts, you know, they're as I say, they're necessary but dangerous. A lot of litigation comes from them. And really what happens is, I know this won't come as a shock to anyone, but sometimes if time passes, people's memories diverge about an incident that happened involving the both of them. I know this is not a shocking proposition, but you can imagine that both sides, even in good faith, not, not trying to be fraudsters, not trying to cheat somebody out of a deal, they just tend to remember things differently over time. And uh, not shockingly, people tend to remember it to their own advantage. And that's the real danger of oral contracts. And that's why a lot of times the only way you can really sort out what was agreed to and what really is important and what isn't is um, to look at performance. So if the parties enter into an oral agreement to do something that's enforceable under the law and isn't one of those contracts that has to be in writing, and then there later comes a disagreement as to some fundamental term, the, the way you're most likely to sort that out if you're a court or a juror or an arbitrator is to um, look at how they've acted up to the point of disagreement. And that's really the, the danger in all that is if you have performed, say, over six months in a certain way, and then something changes and you say, oh, that's not really what we agreed to. You know, you're supposed to pay me in five days, not 15, even though you've accepted payment on the 15th day every time. So I'm going to charge you interest for those 10 days, or I'm going to terminate this, you know, you might be able to terminate it anyway. But... Um, you know, you can see where the problems arise. So that's why you want to, certainly if you're in business, certainly if you're working on things, you have to, you have to, have to, have to get it in writing. Now, in business and, and in what both as lawyers, paralegals, people administering contracts, people helping prepare contracts, um, et cetera, Invoices and forms are commonplace. They are contracts. They are, they are probably, if you just went by volume, one of the most common types, maybe the most common type of contract. Purchase orders, invoices. If you go rent a car, you've signed a contract with Hertz. Now, I hate to admit this, but I'll admit it anyway. It's the sort of contract a lot of people don't, don't even read when they sign it. They either think they know what's in it or they don't really care and they know they won't get the car if they don't sign it. And, but those are, by volume, I'm sure, uh, the most common types of contracts. And they all have terms in them that people aren't really aware of or don't really think about. You know, any purchase order on the back side of it is going to have a bunch of terms and conditions. It might say, it might do with insurance during shipping or where the risk of loss shifts, or it may be uh, uh, certain quality things. It may be warranties. Uh, it may be if you're uh, on the flip side of that, if it's a if it's a uh, invoice with, being sent out with the goods for payment, it may have limitations of damages, it may have uh, disclaimers of warranties, it may have uh, varying uh, risk of loss or payment terms that are different from what one might expect. And this is where a lot of confusion can arise. For instance, if somebody sends in a purchase order with certain terms and conditions on it, 
and then gets back an invoice with different terms and conditions and then takes those goods and pays for them. In most instances, depending on the content of the actual you know, language, unless there's something that would really vary it, um, the second contract is going to control simply because um, you've got a situation that might be viewed more as a counter offer. And then the payment, the acceptance of the goods and payment for them would be viewed as an acceptance of that counter offer as opposed to um, an acknowledgement that the first set of terms was really what was binding. And that's a, um, that's a difficult issue. Now, if you're dealing with somebody repetitively, you've usually got that worked out and you may even have a separate sort of master sales agreement that would deal with each individual shipment of goods over time. But if, if, if you have a business that does a lot of one-off uh, purchase and sale uh, activity, um, you need to pay close attention to these things. Now, this happens, uh, it says on here, make sure all parts of the forms are exchanged. That seems like the most simplistic thing in the world to say. But here's why that matters. And, and it, in fact, does matter. Um, back when fax machines were popular, this, this used to happen more, but it still happens if you're scanning a document in to email it to somebody. And you forget to scan both sides of the document. And so, say a purchase order or an invoice goes out via email and the, the terms and conditions have been left out. They, they aren't, if, if they were not exchanged, if they were not part of the deal, a court isn't later going to enforce them under the theory of, oh, we just forgot. That can happen in other types of contracts as well. And this is an issue that shockingly happens. People are, let's say you're doing a um, business transaction and you're selling a business. You may need, obviously, you're going to have a fairly complicated contract that maybe has a number of subparts to it and exhibits and whatnot. A very common thing is, for instance, let's say you're selling a, a business as an ongoing concern. You want to have a list, you know, Exhibit A might be all the contracts that the purchaser is assuming. And Exhibit B might be all the contracts that the purchaser is not assuming. Uh, and continuing, so they're not being assigned to the purchaser. Well, you're rushing through, and people are busy, and it's it's more difficult than you think to figure out what all the contracts are, and you've got some of them on there on the list, but not all of them. So you say, "Hey, let's go ahead and get the let's get this deal's got to close today. The money's got to flow today. You know, the wiring instructions. We're ready to punch the button, and we'll just fill in that last thing later." We'll just, we'll get exhibit A. We'll, we'll get it together. Um, I'm sure more times than not, that works out fine. But in, 20, in almost 28 years, I have had at least three lawsuits that involved the missing exhibit, the exhibit that everybody was going to get to, and then when push comes to shove, nobody can agree what was supposed to be on that exhibit. And that is, it's an almost unsolvable problem for a court. It can blow up a whole deal, or it can put you in a position where you have to pay a premium to get the deal locked down. So I guess the simplest thing is, don't, you know, don't do that. <laughs> but that's easier said than done, because, you know, when you're on the cleanup crew like the litigation folks are, uh, it's easy to say, well, they just shouldn't have done that. They probably had a good reason for doing it at the time, but you've got to follow up immediately and you know, maybe even hold something in escrow while you work out those last little things so that there'll be a, a way of balancing out uh, the work and, frankly, setting the correct incentives to get it done. Because if you don't do that, things can really blow up. And that's not... That's not what anybody wants.